Hello, my name is Sanja Milosavljevic and I'm going to be your host today. Uh, uh, today my guest is uh, Agnieszka Pugacevic and she comes from Poland. She is a university teacher and um, I hope that you're going to enjoy our conversation. So Agnieszka, hi, hello, how are you? Hi, I'm good, how are you? Uh, I'm fine and uh, uh, I'm actually uh, quite satisfied because you um, uh, you agreed <clears throat> to participate in this project. I ask you, you were the uh, among the first persons I asked to participate in this podcast. Uh, and I'm so I'm so glad that, that uh, we finally found time uh, to uh, do this because um, uh, you are very interesting as a person, but uh, uh, also what do you what you do is also very interesting. So uh, can you tell us something about yourself? What do you do? What is your educational background? And um, how uh, you are not an, in, uh, an entrepreneur, but how are you connected to entrepreneurship? Okay, thanks for having me in your podcast. This is a very noble and interesting idea. And um, about myself, I'm not a um, normal academic, I would say. <laughs> I'm something in between academia and uh, business and um, administration or NGOs, the first sector, third sector. So I'm um, balancing in between having some teaching at the university, but also doing research for uh, applications, for uh, something that is needed in the world outside academia. So I prefer practicality over theory. In this sense, um, 10 years ago, I opened also my small consulting company uh, to uh, develop changes within academia because I think we still behave in an old school way. So my uh, entrepreneurial approach was related to changes within the academic system. So I joined a, a very innovative, I think, um, center at the university that is called Digital Economy Lab, where we assess the impacts of uh, technologies on society and community, but also allow entrepreneurship within academia. And uh, it was five years ago, and now we have already an incubator within the university, which is a new thing. And it's very popular among students, among PhD students, and also some researchers as well. And we accelerated also with spin-offs, the, the companies that based on uh, IP developed at the ac academia. And uh, starting from like three of them, now we have around 20, not only in hard science, but also in social, social and humanities um, topics and areas. So basically, I'm always looking for new opportunities. In this sense, I'm entrepreneurial academic, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yes, maybe you can we, you can call it uh, like that. Uh, for me, it's it's very interesting to hear this everything you said uh, because uh, in Serbia we are we have those techno parks and we something is happening, but I still think that we lack the connection between business administration, innovative ideas. Uh, I don't know copyright, uh, uh, mm -hmm. tech startups whatever kind of startup. So like there is no nothing that connects those dots. And if you want, if I want to develop a business, maybe I have a business background, but I'm not, how should I say, maybe I'm not uh, an engineer and I need an engineer to help me develop my business. So can you tell us something more? You said, uh, you mentioned that uh, there are um, startups that are not just in tech, but also in social and, and humanities. Uh, mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us something more about that? And can you share an example? Mm, actually, uh, they are a little bit connected with technology. They are not from hard sciences, like biology, chemistry or physics, but uh, they represent, for example, journalism mm -hmm. and the uh, research for trends in uh, media, in texts text databases. So they use data science 
to retrieve information from various sources available on internet, on various uh, publications, and they retrieve it from huge amounts of texts. So this is the, the startup. Um, another one is more for educational purposes. Um, uh, a young uh, PhD student opened this company to uh, teach practical contact uh, for like geography and geology. They, they go outside, they, uh, the, um, they visit various forms of uh, you know, uh, stones, in various uh, areas of Poland, and um, the children learn on the spot. Uh, they touch the things, and they, they just uh, have this learning journey with this startup, with this uh, spin-off. So uh, he uh, commercialized um, his geographical knowledge in this sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of the of the spin-offs are generally from from biology and physics and you know they just license the knowledge and they help develop new drugs new solutions for medicine and this what is the most uh, like valuable in in terms of the university income and the researchers income well it's because it's it's you can easily scale up those those kind of startups they can scale up so Plus, they mm -hmm. probably develop a product that is more needed uh, on the market. Uh, uh, sure. What is your? What is your? Um, can you can you tell us uh, what is education for you? When you say education, what do you mean? Education is something that you learn uh, every day. That you have every day around you. Whenever you do anything, you learn all the time. And uh, either it could be through a formal way, you go to school or you learn uh, remotely from your school or university. Uh, it could be uh, informal in this sense that you, this is not educational uh, system, but someone who advises you about something does the trainings or you do it by, you learn by doing. So you don't even know that you learn. And the third way, I think it's the best way because it's the easiest. You remember a lot from this. And it is even confirmed in scientific research that you remember the, the most when you do a simulation or perform the work. So uh, I prefer these active forms of education and I try as much as possible whenever I teach students because I, I teach entrepreneurship. I try to uh, to ask them to experiment uh, with everything we learn and just to put a little bit of theory and then confront it with the real world and even bring the opinion that no, this theory doesn't work and it's something else in the real world because uh, usually the economic theories are just a small part of real world and the parameters that uh, affect the, the system. Uh, are numerous, so so you never know if your the theory would work in a real setting. That's the education um, I, I I got from my uh, economics career, and uh, I try to apply this approach with open heart, open mind, and um, especially as nowadays the knowledge. The information is available through internet. Of course, you need to critically approach it and verify the validity and uh, the reality of the information. But also um, what you learn from is other people. It's cooperation with other people. It's joining in teams. And you don't need to be a knowledgeable, very knowledgeable person as long as you keep contact with others because you learn a lot from them. You exchange information and you build something new. And for example, um, I think in that education uh, is something nowadays that we need to sell as a product, as uh, you do, for example, in your business, because um, there are lots of, for example, YouTube uh, presenters that teach students or pupils at school. And in order to offer something more, you need to prepare a value proposition while you teach. 
So something that is not available uh, in internet, something that is uh, brought up out of your experience, expertise, but something unique, something more. And um, you need to sell the knowledge in 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 new way uh, uh, to connect some information to ask the students to apply this knowledge. And this is it. This is the new way of learning nowadays. This is my, my, my opinion. It's very competitive world now. And the teachers are under much pressure, a lot of pressure, pressure from, from for example, YouTube presenters mm -hmm. or robots even because they can offer the, the lectures. Even there is a saying, every teacher that could be replaced by a robot should be. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a new world. Uh, hmm. And everyone is adjusting to some new rules, so yeah. uh, teachers also. Uh, it used to be a very respectable profession and teachers thought that they will always be, I don't know, uh, respected mm -hmm. parts of the society. But as you said, they are now under pressure, pressure from the YouTube. How did mm -hmm. this uh, pandemic change your everyday life in terms of uh, going to the university, uh, teaching to your students? How did it change? Do you do you like working from home or or actually how is it organized? Do you go to the mm -hmm. university? Do you have live live lectures? Uh, no, I don't have face-to-face -face lectures. Uh, we were advised to uh, teach remotely, starting from uh, the end of March this year. And uh, each faculty had decided on its own whether to do this uh, online or uh, blended learning in the new academic year that started in September. And most of the um, faculties decided to put it uh, in a remote way, so I also teach remotely. Mm, and even when we started to have um, this red zone, it started two weeks ago, um, I think even the practical uh, laboratories and exercises are not uh, allowed anymore within the university. So everything went again to a lockdown form, so we stay at home. Uh, and the students just stay with the families uh, if they are from not from Warsaw and those who are from Warsaw um, did not move outside the city but uh, do not attend the university. So basically uh, this is the new normal for us. Mm -hmm. But is it, it is new normal and you have to just adjust, but how do you feel about mm -hmm. it? Is it, is it, uh, can this uh, kind of teaching be um, productive? Can, can your students actually learn? It is a live word, but still it's different when you have somebody who is in front of you and you can, you have different energy than when you, when mm -hmm. you teach remotely. Yeah, it's completely different process in terms of achieving the uh, expected outcomes. And um, I think we do, did not yet prepare the specific way of uh, offering uh, the lectures and exercises in a remote setup. So we try, what we try to do, and we are even obliged by the system, which is really not effective, I think, is to do one-to-one, -one, like uh, one hour and a half of lectures mm -hmm. that we used to have in the classroom, now transferred transfer it to the online setup. So you just keep talking to, <laughs> when you have a lecture from, for example, basic law lecture, you need to talk for one hour and a half, especially as you, as you have a huge group, like 300 people attending your lecture. And this is not the way it should be because no one is really prepared to be productive in terms of concentration in sitting like me mm. now in one <laughs> pose, not moving in the class, not using you know con eye contact because the students usually, especially in the morning, then they don't use the cameras, and I think it's it's okay. <laughs> but um, but in this sense, um, it's not the same because um, we get 
a kind of uh, digital tiredness very quickly when you have uh, this platform of communication, this intermediate way of contacting the students on the other side, or you, or, <laughs> the, or the, the virtual meetings, anyway, yeah. And um, being concentrated and uh, trying to um, have a, a conversation it's very demanding. It's very hard to get the students involved nowadays. The, they used to be very quiet. They are not like, um, for example, American students that always ask questions and everything. They are like mm, sitting with their heads down sometimes. Um, so what we try to do, we invent uh, new ways of interaction. So quizzes, questions, uh, breakout rooms uh, when they talk in smaller groups, uh, some uh, whiteboards uh, that are digital whiteboards, um, there are some solutions. But it's only possible when you have a small group. With large groups, I think the best way would be to um, let the, the, the lecturer re record the lecture. And then the students listen to the lecture piece by piece in small chunks whenever convenient for them. And then they meet with the lecturer to discuss all the difficult issues. So it's a it's basically known concept of, of flipped classroom mm -hmm. when uh, most of the time uh, the work is done individually or in groups outside the class. And whenever there's something to do together, uh, the students meet, meet with the teacher, who is now called not the teacher, but a facilitator, educational <laughs> facilitator. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, more, more uh, responsibility is put on the student himself, herself mm -hmm. in, this, in this system. But we do not teach it uh, in the school to be responsible for your learning process. Yeah, you, we, you, do, you do not have these courses, how to plan the week or how to plan, um, how to teach up to get the knowledge to pass the exam. Um, there is one uh, good example, however, I think it's uh, the homeschooling setup. When the families, uh, especially those who already have a longer experience with it, uh, found uh, the way they um, learned that this, the, the children found their own way of studying. So they uh, cut the, the whole material into smaller pieces. They do not sit in front of the computer. They also use the, uh, the, the books, uh, like paper. <laughs> they get more from... <laughs> from something from all their forms, like writing, reading from, from the books. Mm, so I think uh, you can cope with it. And those who are really uh, resistant to this uh, remote schooling effect after the, the lockdown were those families that were just, okay, we just don't have the exams at school face to face, but maybe it's even better because we just meet with a teacher once in front of the computer, and this is it. We pass the exams, and our life that does not change apart from the you know uh, health uh, stresses that we all had. If we got ill, if we, our family would, would stay safe, and etc. So uh, there are good examples, but uh, the system should be open to get out the most of these examples. But it does not much happen. So the system should yeah. get out of the box, not not yeah, not the students, not, not individuals, but the system should get yeah, out of the box. Yeah. I think the homeschooling yeah. is a perfect example, but I think it's mm -hmm. also uh, convenient for younger children. Uh, mm. Because when you are at the university, you you really need your teacher to guide you, to mentor you, to uh, transfer the knowledge. But when you are younger, when you are in a I don't know, fourth or, f or fifth grade. Uh, homeschooling is basically very, very nice way to um, to finish the school year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are pros and cons, you know, because I know students from secondary school that mm -hmm. did their uh, matura exam, we call it the final exam when you are about 18. 
We also, uh, sorry, and, sorry, Agnieszka, we also uh, call it ma- matura. Matura. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they did their maturas without any problem while homeschooling themselves and getting rich, uh, reaching out for as much as possible for various sources of knowledge and even uh, watching, you know, there's uh, plenty of sources you can watch, um, uh, like massive open online courses to teach yourself. Uh, sometimes there are very interesting lectures on YouTube or Facebook or streams or webinars. So uh, if you approach it with, with your open mind, you find a way to uh, solve even the most difficult problems now. Uh, everything, almost every solution is available in internet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can you uh, can, can we return to something you said at the beginning? Uh, you said that you are using, uh, you are doing some research, and you are using mm-hmm. uh, data science. So, and you said uh, the project lasted for five years. Is it correct? It's still uh, going. It's ongoing. Uh, it started uh, five years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But can you and share? And we do uh, small projects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What what way uh, we we approach the the, the data now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So firstly, uh, for example, we were in, uh, engaged in a European Union Commission uh, the Commission uh, European mm-hmm. Commission project for future of internet mm-hmm. to find the trending uh, topics like blockchain, AI, um, uh, some other issues, uh, robotization, automation, machine learning, etc. And uh, to do this, uh, we uh, scrubbed, it's called web scraping, uh, va- various websites, uh, public forums, non-public forums, Uh, scientific uh, sources, non-scientific, formal, informal sources, hacker spaces available in internet to find out what is uh, trending, what is emerging as uh, in a discussion uh, that is going on in academia and uh, in society and civil society through internet. And it was huge database that should be prepared, uh, cleaned, and then um, the the most important things uh, are extracted to present it in a dynamic way and on a website. So we do this in, um, in it's, its data visualization. When you move from one topic to another and you decide what to search for more, then you are guided like with a press PowerPoint presentation. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it is also a new way uh, to approach the information and to engage the, the reader how to interpret the data. So, so we have, for example, um, this website And also, uh, when we do research for companies, we did it for production companies, how they transform uh, digitally. So mm-hmm. we did also, based on the questionnaire, we prepared the results as an interactive uh, website. So there was no almost no writing, it was visualization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because people prefer to watch the pictures not to read much they, they do not have much time uh, you know they say that our memory uh, is uh, three seconds our short-term memory is three seconds now it was seven seconds and now it's three uh. seconds because we are all scrolling and uh, so may- maybe that's why we like to watch uh, f- pictures rather than to read uh, it it as you said it, it takes time uh, mm-hmm. Can you can you tell us uh, about the state of entrepreneurship in Poland? Like, mm-hmm. what is what is trendy? Uh, what about uh, I don't know food sector or food industry? Uh, and what about I don't know tech sector or tech industry? I know mm-hmm. for sure that many products now in Serbia actually come uh, from from Poland. When you when you read the uh, the the 
producer information you see that it comes from mm -hmm. labels yeah you see it's either it says eu but it's poland so what is the state of entrepreneurship uh, and what is the state of food industry in uh, that that would be my second question food industry in poland mm. In terms of entrepreneurship, we are based on numerous small and medium-sized enterprises, like 97% of companies are small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. And um, I think uh, um, more and more, especially when new people approach uh, business, are based on new uh, way of running a company. So um, they try to be open to others more, to trust more, they involve in some kind of federations or associations that support entrepreneurs. They share the no their knowledge and exchange the knowledge. And this new type uh, of companies, especially startups, including scaling startups, emerged like 10 years ago or like 10, 15 years ago, especially after we joined the European Union in 2004. Because um, not only there was a new way, new approach to free market opportunities, but also some funding emerged uh, that was uh, dedicated to innovative businesses. Uh, we also failed in this because most of these companies, when the funding uh, stopped, uh, they also stopped, but some of them, uh, some of the, entre of the entrepreneurs developed something new later on. So I think in this um, sense, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit is growing very much in Poland. And there are many, many meetings, despite this lockdown and pandemic, that they, they are uh, available on the internet where people share their knowledge first, um, piece, piece of knowledge for free, and then they invite people to cooperate further. And uh, uh, most of them are based on internet uh, communication. The channels are mostly, the contact channels are, are, are developed uh, through internet, through social media. Um, now, you know, uh, with, with the restrictions, um, like the gastronomy sector, this is closed completely in uh, sit in form. So they need to uh, deliver the takeaways. So, for example, in Warsaw, um, as the prices were very high for transportation offered by uh, big players, you know, the platform mm -hmm. players, so the, the uh, restaurants, they joined their forces and they opened a new platform for transportation. It's Perfect. Called, called Knipe. Yeah, and uh, they, uh, they decreased the, the cost of delivery. So... I think it's and it's also supported by the the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, there are forms of you know emerging entrepreneurship uh, where people find a solution out in the crisis because crisis is not only the danger but also an opportunity. So maybe uh, they will uh, if if they survive because some of them don't survive and even in my. Uh, surroundings uh, some people had to close the business the gastro, gastro uh, gastronomy business uh, cafeteria was closed so um, it depends it depends uh, what you want to do there are many opportunities if you want to survive you need to work harder if you want to switch to something else you need to just uh, take a step back and think what you want to do and the second question, the food sector, um, I think uh, it's uh, it's very traditional in Poland. Uh, it's very well established in this sense. Uh, we uh, are one of the biggest exporters of apples, for example, in, in the world. Uh, we export a lot of meat, to even to China, to, to very uh, far away countries. And uh, we also had, uh, have innovations uh, regarding this sector because there's a new consortium of, uh, of uh, food, uh, food uh, innovators. Mm -hmm. And also our university is participating uh, in this 
EIT food uh, consortium that offers not only the grants but also acceleration and um, research on food uh, innovation. I think lots of things are going on in mm -hmm. Poland uh, as, as regards food. And what is funny, um, in terms of um, vegan restaurants, we are the first I wanted in the world. To, sorry. <laughs> So I wanted Sorry. to I wanted to ask you about the vegan restaurants. Really, mm. that would be my next question because you said that you are you are the third in the world in mm -hmm. uh, in, for in having Warsaw. Warsaw is the third in the world in terms of having uh, in terms of number of vegan restaurants mm. uh, per per inhabitants. I think per number of inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So after, I think it's uh, Los Angeles and Berlin, we are the third or fourth, something like this. Mm -hmm. So whenever you are vegan, come to Warsaw, you will have your takeaway. Even in my neighborhood, like two blocks away, there are at least two vegan restaurants, full, like one is um, vegan ramen, you know. I know, I remember, I remember that okay. restaurant. We've been there, mm -hmm. <laughs> or not, we, you try it. Uh, no, I think oh. they were. Th I think that they were closed at the time uh, we went there. But we met the lady, and she runs that restaurant, and her dog. I think uh, we just spoke yeah. to them a bit. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 something like this, and then a the restaurant, and they sell the flowers, and um, and also they sell food that is more of Asia style, Asian style as well. It's not uh, noodles, but uh, pasta or, or ramen, but uh, it's it's uh, something related to Asian style of cuisine. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us something? It's very interesting for me that uh, vegan movement. When when did it happen? Uh, is it something uh, uh, just uh, trendy and hype, or if you have that that, that number of vegan restaurant, that means that people change their habits. When when yes. did that happen? I think it's it is a matter of last uh, three years, five years more maybe. Um, you know, also it's a bit of an um, extraordinary uh, community because we have lots of activism in Warsaw. Local communities are very active to take care of the uh, district they live in. They participate in a local participation budget. We have it, so you can apply with a project to uh, to help a kind of a problem to be solved uh, in your area, and people vote. All the all the all the city votes. So I think this way uh, there are more um, their man mindset is more. Um, uh, directed towards climate change and on all these uh, uh, social economical challenges we face nowadays. So, if you are a cli climate adv advisor and you follow the uh, follow the uh, science behind it, you would not want to make the CO two more available in the in the in the, in the air. So you don't want uh, the massive production of meat, and then you switch uh, your eating style to vegan. This is it. Or you become a flexitarian, so sometimes eat vegan, sometimes mm -hmm. not. And uh, <clears throat> as, as the businesses are located in Warsaw, it's very huge concentration. So probably the preference is also changed and people switch from one uh, you know delivery of lunch that is based on meat to another that is that is uh, vegan so uh, well, another point is uh, that is very very common in poland that poles love uh, the variety so whenever you come to poland you have at least 10 uh, varieties of ketchup or mayonnaise <laughs> or everything so so you, you can choose because there's a huge competition in each sector lots of producers Mm -hmm. And w which what is resulting? They are very small. They are not concentra concentrated in this sense. So that you you have those varieties of one uh, product, but they are small and they don't grow as much as they could be growing. 
<laughs> and become huge. Uh, and how did the pandemic mm -hmm. change you personal, personally? Did it affect you uh, in, in any way? In my case, um, the problem was only in the first time when we were locked down, not allowed to go outside almost. Mm, and uh, it was kind of strange that they closed all the sport halls. It was not available and I'm a fan of training sports. And um, it was a problem. Uh, I had to train at home, do those ex strange exercises and uh, making noise to my neighbors while <laughs> jumping on the floor. So it was the, the problem. In uh, in some in in the in terms of uh, working, I used to work already a lot uh, remotely or um, part time and uh, remotely part time in the office. So uh, for me, it was not much change. Uh, so I was self dependent on me how I arrange my uh, arrange my day in order to uh, deliver the the outcomes this was my decision so uh, i i was used to it so in my in my personal um, situation it was just a slight change to to work to arrange you know the the table more uh, for like delivering the teaching online and, and uh, to separate the the spheres more for relax and for work and to, to calm down my dog because he interrupts me all the time. He sits with me and whenever, now I ask my husband to keep it away, <laughs> <laughs> but usually he stays with me and as we live next to like first floor and every time another dog comes by our block of flats, uh, he barks, my dog barks and he, he takes care of the whole building <laughs> because he's very responsible. So he, like, a, uh, like a child, annoying child, he, he interrupted many times my, my work. <laughs> but uh, generally, all in all, it was not very a problematic experience for me myself, especially as I was also supported as an entrepreneur from the um, public funds that we got. Uh, it's called Anti-Crisis Shield and it was available when uh, your income diminished and it was the case uh, in my situation in March and April. So I was uh, also, as a company, I was a little bit supported and not asked to pay this taxes, the social security taxes for a few months, like three months, I think, which was good. Yes, we had we had similar similar measures here. So uh, Agnieszka, we just um, reached the end of our conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, can you, what would be your message to entrepreneurs mm -hmm. of the world? To all the entrepreneurs of the world, I think <laughs> team up with people you think they think alike. So the mindset is the most important thing in your case. And share your knowledge because when you share with others, uh, the value grows and then the value is shared as well, the bigger value. So open up yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when you say to a uh, team with uh, people that think alike, uh, don't you think that sometimes some good results can can come from uh, discussion from uh, with, with people that don't think alike? What do you think? I, about I know, that? yeah, I know. So okay. be open to work hard with people that have similar mi mindset and uh, you want to discuss with, even though they can challenge you. Do it, work with them uh, day by day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka, once again. Uh, this was uh, a real pleasure. Uh, I like uh, speaking to people from academia because you know you have the theoretical knowledge plus you have the that, that side that you like the practical side of the of the teaching yes. and yeah. So um, thank you so much.
uh, uh, and um, I hope you also enjoyed our conversation. Yes, it was a pleasure. I didn't know I can talk a lot about it, but I could uh, still talk one hour more. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, so, um, good people of the world, uh, you were watching and listening to Mondopreneur podcast uh, with our guest Agnieszka Pugacevic from Warsaw, Poland. Uh, you can always follow us on social media, uh, on audio platforms, uh, and you can subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. And uh, one thing that I always um, forget to say, this whole project is supported by U.S. Embassy in Belgrade. So until next week, stay safe and stay in good health.